What I want to talk about today is improving feed efficiency to promote a sustainable dairy industry. I'm going to focus mostly on ways that we can do that through uh, genetics, actually. I'm a nutritionist, but I will spend most of my time talking about animal selection. Are there any geneticists in the audience? Perfect. Then you will have to believe everything I say. <laughs> I used to think geneticists were incredibly smart people because I didn't understand what they did. And now I find they, they are smart people, okay? But I've enjoyed working with them in the last five years, have had the opportunity uh, to be part of a big USDA grant that um, specifically stated that we needed to have geneticists and nutritionists working together to develop genomic solutions to improving feed efficiency in dairy cattle. Okay, and um, as we think about dairy cattle, I just like to think about, well, where did they come from? Okay, so the, we, we've been altering dairy cattle genetics uh, for 9,000 years. Ever since they started off looking like uh, the Eurasian auroc, uh, which is now extinct, uh, to the modern ideal Holstein cow. Most of that selection was based on the animal's phenotype, and we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, population geneticists rapidly uh, started to accelerate that progress about uh, 80 years ago. Uh, and we've made a lot of progress based on uh, a few numbers, but also on what the cows look like. Modern dairy cows today are taller, thinner, they're less muscular, they have bigger udders, they can produce a lot more milk. Uh, but today, uh, we have data and we have lots of it. And I would like to uh, focus a little bit on some of that. Okay, so today the dairy cow is much product more productive than she was 100 years ago. This is average milk production in the U.S. Uh, over the last 100 years. Uh, I'm sure that for most developed countries, uh, much of Europe and uh, Canada, it would be similar. Um, uh, we saw uh, 100 years ago, they were about 2,000 kilograms of milk per year. Now we're closer to 10,000 kilograms or 10,000 liters per milk of milk per cow per year. And um, along the way, gross efficiency, that is the amount of energy, gross energy of the feed that's captured in milk or body tissues, has risen from about uh, less than 10% actually to about 20% or perhaps a little greater than that. So dairy cows today produce a lot more milk, and they use feed more efficiently to do that. And most of the reason they use feed more efficiently is because we've selected for cows that produce more milk. And efficiency has just been a byproduct of that selection. Uh, in the future, um, it's going to be harder to improve feed efficiency just by focusing on milk production. But genomics and reproductive technologies have changed uh, things considerably and considerably, and we can make changes very, very quickly in the future. And as a group, nut uh, nutritionists, dairy management specialists of all sorts really need to think together about what kind of cow we want in the future. Feed efficiency, uh, as Jennifer talked about in the last uh, presentation, is really a pretty complicated trait. We could consider food that is consumable by humans, food that is not consumable by humans, uh, and there are other inputs, non-food usable energy sources, uh, land and water, and then the output, the one we're especially interested in, is human consumable milk or beef. But there are products that are not consumable by humans that are also important. Some of them go into the pet food industry. Um, and then there are wastes, and sometimes we capture those wastes, sometimes they're uh, environmental pollutants. Uh, Jennifer talked about methane. Uh, and one thing that I, 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 I thought about asking you a question, I know we talked about this, is the whole issue of land use. And if you put land use into the equation, it changes everything. Because if we can get more milk from the same amount of land, we could potentially use land to grow trees or biomass that could help us out uh, in many other ways. Moreover, there are many other things uh, that are important when we think about feed efficiency. How we feed cows has uh, not only climate impacts, the methane issue, but affects profitability, ecosystem services, land available for wildlife, um, and a number of other things that I don't have time to get into. That's all too complicated to think about uh, as a nutritionist or as a, as a tool for how to breed cows or select for cows. So I want to bring it down to two things, and I want to think mostly about energetic efficiency. Um, so we have the gross energy value of a feed. That's the that's the total chemical energy available in a food if you wanted to use it to heat your house. Okay, 
Some of that energy is not digestible. It's lost as feces. Some of it will be converted to methane. Some of it will be lost in urine. Urea is about 80% of the uh, energy losses in urine. And then some of it will be lost as heat as the cow metabolizes it to get to the net energy that she can actually use at the tissue level. And so that we call net energy. So we have some energy losses along the way. And then the net energy, not all of that will be converted to milk or meat because some of it is lost as heat for maintenance. So I want to break up how we think about feed efficiency into these two, first, uh, two different uh, arrows. And I'll first start off with uh, the second one. And I'll say that to improve efficiency, we need to con increase the conversion of this GE to any and also increase the amount of milk produced relative to maintenance requirements. So uh, along that line, is there an optimal level of milk production and body size uh, for a dairy cow? Uh, uh, to date, this I think is the highest producing cow on record, at least in terms of how much milk solid she's produced. Um, and this is a cow that in 365 days produced 1,270 kilograms of fat and 970 kilograms of protein. An incredible record. And if I had this cow, I wouldn't even care how big she was. Uh, I wouldn't worry about cow size. As long as I would find a free stall to make her fit, um, I would be thrilled with this cow. But we don't have many cows that actually produce that much milk, but many of them are quite good. But, so why is efficiency related to productivity? Um, it comes down to something we call the dilution of maintenance. So as if a cow eats just enough to meet her maintenance needs, we would say she's eating at 1x maintenance and all of her feed, 100%, is used for maintenance. If she eats twice that much, now only 50% of her feed is used for maintenance. And if she eats three times that much, now only 33% of her food is used for maintenance. <clears throat> so as a cow uh, produces more relative to maintenance requirements, a smaller fraction of her food is used for maintenance. A greater fraction is actually converted to the product. And um, if we can increase milk per unit of body weight, we should increase feed efficiency. We could do that either by increasing milk, I'd like to point out, or by decreasing maintenance, either way. And decreasing maintenance, uh, maintenance is highly related to how big an animal is. So, so decreasing body size or increasing milk or doing both together should move us to the right on this graph, and that's a good thing. Except for it, it doesn't go on forever. Okay, so, oops. so I'd like to show, this is data from uh, 5,000 cows in our uh, USDA study. Um, the theoretical line for what would happen to feed efficiency as we increase productivity relative to maintenance is the red line in the background. Uh, the actual data from our 5,000 cows is the, the, are the green dots, and then the, the uh, trend line from that data is the black line. Either way, you can see that higher producing cows are more efficient. Probably uh, feed efficiency will be maximized somewhere. We, we probably will not get much higher than about 35, 40%, especially on a farm basis, because then we have to consider the feed that goes into the young stock that are going to be cows someday. This is only when they're in lactation. Um, but the important point is that the returns to increased efficiency from improving milk production relative to maintenance are diminishing. Okay, so increasing milk production uh, has made a huge uh, effect on uh, efficiency in the dairy industry in the last hundred years. It's doubled it, but that's not likely to happen in the future. <clears throat> and one thing that I think is helpful to note here is that there's a lot of scatter uh, around that. Now, some of that scatter is due to measurement error, but some of it may be due to uh, biological differences between cows. So some cows simply are more efficient than others, even at the same level of production. Okay, so is there uh, an optimal body uh, size for feed efficiency? I'd like to uh, just point out uh, two slides, uh, and I'll show data on the next one. But for 5,700 uh, Holsteins, uh, uh, we found in our project that body weight was not genetically correlated with milk energy per day. The genetic correlation of body weight with gross feed efficiency was negative 0.3. So if I breed for cows that are larger, they will not produce more milk, and they will have higher maintenance requirements and be less 
uh, feed efficient. Uh, Manzanilla Peck, uh, also using our data, uh, this was a, a study uh, from Wageningen in the Netherlands, showed the same thing for stature. So if I breed for taller cows, they won't produce more milk, but they will be less feed efficient. And the dairy industry has been doing both of these for the last 30, 40 years. We've been breeding for taller, bigger cows simply because we think they're pretty. And um, uh, I think our data is pretty clear that selecting for bigger, taller cows does not increase milk, and it will decrease feed efficiency. Um, I have numbers for that. I realize I have these two slides backwards, but uh, just to emphasize that again, uh, the uh, genetic correlation, that is what will happen if I, if I select for this trait, genetic correlation is uh, basically zero for uh, body weight and milk energy, and it's very positive for gross efficiency in milk energy, but when you look at body weight and gross efficiency, there's a negative correlation. The non-genetic correlation between those two traits, milk output and body weight, is actually positive. And that could be because animals that are larger, perhaps were healthier, perhaps they're more competitive at the feed bunk, I don't know, but in any case, there's a positive correlation there, but the genetic correlation is practically zero. For selection for milk and against, against body size should increase feed efficiency. So that's the, uh, the second part of this, okay? The second arrow is improving or decreasing uh, the maintenance portion of how much a cow eats so that we can improve feed efficiency. Now I want to talk a little bit about the first part. So what can we do to increase how able a cow is to digest or metabolize her food. <clears throat> so this was the dilution of maintenance, and I want to talk about something called residual feed intake. Okay, so residual feed intake is a trait that the uh, beef industry has been looking at for uh, many years and is relatively new to the dairy industry, although you can go back about 20 years in the literature and find a uh, uh, rural veer camp uh, in the Netherlands was talking about it quite a long time ago. And he actually came up with a heritability for RFI of about 0.17, which is exact, but it was based on 200 some cows, and we now have the same heritability with 5,000 cows. So what's RFI? So it's simply saying um, we're, gonna we're gonna predict intake for a cow based on her milk energy output, her body weight to the three quarter power, a proxy for her maintenance requirement, or an estimate of it, and then also uh, some coefficient times the change in body energy that you measure in, in a cow over time. And then along with that, we would say, okay, well, uh, season could be important. So a cohort of cows is all the cows that are eating the same diet at the same time. And you would expect that season could be part of that or diet. So if a cow is eating uh, corn silage versus alfalfa, these would all influence feed efficiency. And what I want to know is, if I predict feed intake based on all of these things, are there some cows that don't need as much food to give the same amount of milk as others? Because those are the cows I would like to select for. I'd like more of those cows. Cows with a negative RFI eat less than I expect, so their measured feed intake is less than I would expect uh, to give the same amount of milk as a cow that might be above the line. So. As I mentioned, the heritability for our phi on our 5,000 cows is about 0.17. Uh, and that's important because it means that the geneticists are excited that this is a trait we could select for. But it's also important that, be a, that it be a trait that is repeatable. And we've done several studies to show that it's a repeatable trait whether you feed a cow a high fiber diet or a high starch diet. The high fiber could either be uh, something like soy hulls, a, a, a high fiber concentrate, or it could be a diet that's got more forage in it. So we looked at 40% uh, NDF diets versus 30% uh, NDF diets with, the, with it all being forage fiber that made the difference. It's repeatable across climates. We've got cows in our study that are from Florida. We've got cows in uh, Iowa and Michigan and Wisconsin that were in the summer versus in the winter. Um, it's repeatable across lactation numbers uh, and lactation stage, later early lactation, and then there's even data to show that it's repeatable. Uh, if you find heifers that eat less than expected for a gro given growth rate, they will also turn out to be cows that uh, eat less than expected. So that's important because in 50 years, especially this first one I think is important because in 50 years we may use less grain in the dairy industry. We want to make sure as we select for cows today 
that we don't make a mistake in which ones uh, are most efficient uh, in the future on different types of diets. <clears throat> Um, the basis for our RFI, or biological basis, is not at all clear, but in some sense it doesn't matter in animal selection. But I, I put this up here just because we, I, I want to point out that we are uh, trying to understand the biological basis of RFI, why one cow might be more efficient than another, independent of its level of production. Um, this is an, uh, these are estimates from uh, uh, Richardson and Hurt about 10 years ago, an Australian group, and they, uh, they suggested that digestibility was probably 10%, uh, explained about 10% of the variation amongst cows in their efficiency. And uh, tissue metabolism uh, was about 40% of the variation. Activity even uh, explained probably 10% of the variation amongst cows. We've done uh, a few studies where we've looked at digestibility in cows along with um, their uh, efficiency rank compared to other animals. And I would, I would suggest that perhaps that number is even a little bit low when animals are fed high fiber diets. So when the diet's high in fiber, digestibility may explain 10 to 30% of the variation between cows. Uh, when the diets were mostly starch, we didn't see uh, that much uh, variation. Uh, we didn't see the clear relationship between digestibility and uh, efficiency. So could we select for um, feed efficiency? Well, the problem on farms is that our traditional way of breeding animals was based on daughter performance. And we don't have the intake phenotype on cows in commercial farms. So our only option really is to start to look at things like genomics. And genomics can help us select for traits that we've always selected for uh, more efficiently, but it can also help us select for new traits, and efficiency is one of those. Okay, so in this case, um, what we do is we look at SNPs. A SNP is a single nucleotide uh, polymorphism, um, and it's basically saying uh, there's, a, there's one uh, a nucleotide difference between this uh, strand and uh, these strands, so that here we have a C and here we have a T. So we, we replaced the C with a T, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism. And um, the SNP itself may have no biological effect, but it's linked to the DNA around it. And if a particular allele is associated or is, is close to some other trait is linked to it, uh, if, it's, if it's associated with a desirable trait like feed efficiency, we can select for the, the T instead of the C. Each single SNP may have very little effect, but the additive effects of lots and lots of SNPs uh, can be important, and typically we are using about 78,000 SNPs across uh, uh, the genome uh, when we look at uh, many of our traits. And this is really, even though it, it seems so complicated, it's really very simple, and if you can do a mathematical model for nutrition, you can surely do this. This is even easier. All we do is we look at each SNP, we look at the, uh, the genotype. One means there's a, a C and a T because each cow has a, a two of each uh, uh, a strand of DNA. Okay, it's a double, uh, not a double helix. There are two of each chromosome. Uh, they're diploid. And then you give a, a value to that particular SNP, okay? Is having a, a, a T instead of a C worth zero, two, three, negative three? What's it worth? You multiply them, you add them all together, and you come up with some sort of genomic prediction value for the trait of interest. So it's a very, very simple mathematical model. And um, when we do that with um, our cows, this is based on 3,000 cows, we find that the, the variance of, uh, for residual feed intake uh, with 3,000 cows is about 0.14, which is very similar to the pedigree-based heritability we found at 0.17. Okay, so it's a trait that the geneticists say, we can use this, we can select for it. And um, we expect that it could, in fact, help improve feed efficiency across the industry. Um, the other thing that geneticists do uh, uh, in modern times is they look at this thing called a Manhattan plot. And in this case, each one of uh, 61,000 SNPs are across the x-axis. 
Uh, each color represents a different chromosome. Granted, cows don't have quite this many chromosomes, but there's some, uh, I don't, I've never understood that part. But anyway, within a chromosome, all they're looking at is, for each SNP, how much uh, variance in the trait of interest is there that's associated with that trait. So in this case, there are some uh, SNPs that are pretty highly correlated with our feed efficiency trait. Granted, it's pretty small, only 2% of the genetic variance. It's pretty small. But then when you accompany that with all the other SNPs and even a very low uh, genetic variance, um, it can start to account for differences in about, four, as I said on the last slide, about 14% of the differences amongst animals. In this case, the top 10 SNP accounted for 7% of the genetic variance, and there were SNPs within that that looked like eventually maybe we can hone in on some of these and say, here's a, here's a particular part of the genome that we may want to actually select for and understand biologically. Okay, but what, how we will probably use this um, in, in the short run is we will start to actually do genomic selection where you use the, the uh, additive variants of all of the SNPs. We have a reference population, 5,000 cows now, hopefully in about 3,000, uh, in three years there'll be more like another 3,000, so 8,000 or 9,000 cows that will serve as a reference population. Um, we'll have known genotypes and phenotypes for these animals, and then we can use those to develop equations so that we can evaluate the genotypes of other animals and decide which ones should be most efficient. <clears throat> okay, there's, a, there's one a great study out there that I think shows that this can actually work with dairy cattle, and it's a study done in Australia. They took, uh, they took growing heifers, and they looked at them and said which ones were most efficient, so they developed equations to predict the, to come up with the residual feed intake for heifers as they grew. And, uh, and then based on those animals they, and their genotypes, they went out and they, they did genotyping on about 2,000 cows in commercial herds, and they said, oh, these look like they should be really efficient, these should be less efficient, and they brought in 200 animals that they, they brought into a common uh, uh, facility and milked them. And um, they found that the ones that should be low RFI, that would be efficient, they eat less than expected. Okay, They had genomic breeding values that were uh, quite different because that, these are the ones they brought in. But when they looked at actually what happened on the farm, the, the low RFI or feed-efficient cows actually took less feed, about a kilogram less feed, uh, than the less efficient cows. So it's proof of concept that this idea can, in fact, work. Um, Australia is already using genomic breeding values um, for RFI in combination with breeding values for smaller body weight per unit of milk. In a feed-saved index, uh, the Netherlands just recently started uh, using a selection technique for feed efficiency as well. Okay, I want to um, end my talk with... Uh, I'll come back to kind of summarize the bit about uh, genetics, but I want to talk just briefly about management. And, and uh, I'm going to do it all with this slide. Okay, so um, when we manage, th there's a lot that we can do for managing for feed efficiency uh, as well. And this is, a, I think, especially important on many of our top herds and in uh, much of the U.S. anyway. Even on larger farms, unfortunately, we have farms that will feed all of their cows the same ration regardless of stage in lactation. So they have what we call a one-group TMR. But uh, it's important to note that there are different feeding goals as we go through a lactation. At the beginning of lactation, our goal really is optimal health. We want to get the animals off to a good start. Um, in early to mid-lactation, our goal is to maximize milk production, but also to have successful breeding. So we want the cows to be bred back. And then when we get toward later lactation, our goal is also to have optimal body condition when the cow dries off so that she will be ready, uh, not too fat, not too thin, ready to go for the next lactation. And along with that, it's important to understand that, that the way intake is regulated in cows is not the same uh, across the lactation. Uh, for much of lactation, intake is probably limited by how much the cow can eat gut fill, how much room there is in her gut. But early in lactation, it seems more complicated than that. And probably it's related by whether the liver feels like it has enough ATP. So, so how we feed cows 
uh, what goals we have and what controls intake are different as we go across the lactation. Therefore, it's really, uh, if I, as a nutritionist, I want to feed cows optimally, it's very difficult to do that with one uh, diet for everybody. Moreover, if we think about protein, uh, protein efficiency parallels energetic efficiency often, but protein is often overfed, especially uh, later in lactation. So if we have several groups of cows within a farm, we can feed uh, high protein diets with expensive supplements early on, cheaper feeds and lower protein diets later on and maximize feed efficiency for both energy and protein. Okay, to summarize, efficient cows produce at a, a, a lot more milk. Efficient cows efficiently convert feed to net energy. And what can we do to try to improve feed, effic feed efficiency? First, we can breed for milk and moderate reductions in cow size. We can select in the future, not yet in the US, but in some countries, Europe and uh, Australia, or parts of Europe. Um, we can select for low, uh, this should say RFI, residual feed intake, or dry matter intake, or feed saved. Um, we can group and feed it according to nutritional needs, uh, feed and manage cows for high production. And then finally, I want to say just a little bit about this one, and that is one way that we could improve feed efficiency is by feeding different some diets just naturally are going to be more efficient than others because it's more efficient to convert fat to milk or starch to milk than it is fiber to milk. Okay, so I could improve feed efficiency by feeding more fat and starch, but that isn't really why we feed cows. The great advantage of ruminants is that they can take fiber and make milk. So I'm hesitant to just look at diets and say this one's more efficient than that. I think that can be a mistake. And for that, we really just need to look at income over feed costs, which one's uh, the best. Um, with that, I would uh, uh, just like to close with this slide saying there, there are things that we can do, uh, just puts it on a, a different way of looking at what I just said, nutritional grouping, and then selecting against unjustified feed intake or residual feed intake, selecting for cows that are maybe a little smaller and produce more milk relative to that body weight. All of these things can help us improve uh, feed efficiency in the future. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.